கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா நமஸ்தே வெல்கம் டு தி செகண்ட் எபிசோட் of Ananya Bhakti. We're going to take a look at some questions that have come up, which I was expecting. <laughs> because the reason I'm making this series is because of the misconceptions and the misunderstandings of bhakti and self-realization and the path in general and Ramana's teaching in particular. So I really uh, was responding to this question uh, even by starting this series. And what is the question? <laughs> well, one friend sent it in this morning and just nailed it exactly. Can I practice Ananya Bhakti without going through Vaidhi Bhakti and Raganuga Bhakti? Well, let me ask you this. Can you run before you can walk? <laughs> can you fly a plane before you can ride a bike? This is the problem. And we touched on it before in the episode of the Esoteric Teaching Series, Jump Up, Fall Down. Uh, this is the story of most people's spiritual life. Jump up, fall down. Try to do some advanced practice, uh, because it sounds really cool. And then fail miserably because of lack of background, qualities, energy, knowledge, whatever. And then go back to a very uh, earlier stage, previous stage, and then try to rationalize what happened, why, and so on. And of course, they blame everyone but themselves. Or in some contexts, when someone has a teacher, but that teacher is not exactly uh, bona fide. The teacher will, will dangle some advanced practice in front of their nose and really talk it up and hype it to the max and make it sound really, really good. And then flatter the students by telling them, oh, you can do this. You're advanced. You're very intelligent. <laughs> and then they try it, and bam, fall flat on your face. So then what? The guru can say, oh, you didn't listen to my instructions. You're not surrendered enough. And that's how they trap people into being followers. I call them zombies because they're not thinking for themselves and they're not observing rightly what's going on. So we have to go back again to the principles that we first introduced in the beginning of this channel, way back five, six years ago in Matrix Learning, that context creates meaning. So in other words, before you can understand the meaning of an instruction, a technique, a realization, an experience, or whatever, <laughs> you have to have the proper context. If the thing is in the wrong context, you will not be able to apply it successfully. That is the criterion. If you 
get an instruction. It's like, okay, you realize the self. And if you can't do it, it means you're holding it in the wrong context. For sure, every single time. Huh? There are many very amusing conversations <laughs> in the book, talks with Bhagwan, and also day by day with Bhagwan. Um, I, I was just looking at one a few minutes ago. Let me share it with you. Bhagwan is talking about, uh, he's talking with a devotee about suffering and how to get rid of the suffering. And he says, well, you have to destroy the mind. And so just like clockwork, the devotee asks how to destroy the mind. They always do this. <laughs> Before they even understand what the mind is, they want to know how to destroy it. <laughs> anyway, Bhagwan answers, seek the mind. On being sought, it will disappear. Now, this is a perfectly beautiful response to this question. How to destroy the mind? Huh? As we've gone over several times in these series, if you go looking for it, you won't be able to find it. And then you realize, ah, it doesn't really exist. Same with the ego. Anyway, what does the guy answer? I do not understand. Remember Kung Fu, that old series with what's his name, Carradine? And that was one of his favorite lines. I do not understand. You doofus, you've been with a guru face to face with a realized soul and you don't understand? Means you're asking the wrong questions or you're holding the answers in the wrong context. So, of course, Bhagwan is very gracious and he continues. The mind is only a bundle of thoughts. The thoughts arise because there is a thinker. The thinker is the ego. The ego, if sought, will vanish automatically. The ego and the mind are the same. The ego is the root thought from which all other thoughts arise. So guess what? Guess what the next question is? How to seek the mind. <laughs> This is hilarious. <laughs> and and Marshy is still, <laughs> he's still being patient with this poor guy. Maybe some of his other disciples were watching, you know, and he was making an example of this poor guy. So anyway, Marshy says, dive within. You are now aware that the mind rises up from within. So sink within and seek. Perfectly clear, perfectly appropriate. What does the guy say? I do not understand how it is to be done. Dude. <laughs> it's like here, here. Take this piece of pizza and eat it. But how? <laughs> it's like, you know, forehead slapping time. How? Duh. Come on. It's your mind. It's your consciousness. You can go within and go look for it, right? But I don't understand how. Oh, God. See, this guy is jumping up and falling down. He's asking about something that's way beyond this, his actual stage of advancement. Maybe to look good to his, some of his associates, his girlfriend or somebody, who knows. And then he gets the perfectly appropriate answer for that question, and he doesn't know what to do with it. He doesn't know how to handle it. 
So similarly, this guy is asking, can I practice Ananya Bhakti without going through Vaidhi and Raganuga? And I'm going, look, context creates meaning. You have to go through the preliminaries to understand the advanced. Is there anything unusual or strange or hard to understand about that? He says, I have never practiced any of this stuff. <laughs> I've never practiced Vaidhi Bhakti or I don't even know what Raganuga Bhakti is, but oh, I'm going to try to practice Vaidhi. I'm going to try to practice Ananya Bhakti. No, you're not. You're going to try to practice your idea of Ananya Bhakti, which is wrong. So it's not going to work. And so you're going to fall down. What can I do? Huh? What can I do? I remember when I was a young kid in high school, I was a pretty good musician for high school kid. I went through the whole thing of, you know, the school band and then the high school band and then all state band and then all eastern band and I finally worked my way up to the all USA high school band and I was the number one flutist uh, first chair flutist in the all USA high school band okay <laughs> I thought I was pretty hot and I went to music camp every summer and we were doing really cool stuff by Hindemith and Shostakovich and Stravinsky and all this stuff in our own spare time. So I thought, man, I got this nailed. I'm going to go to music school. I'm going to, I'm going to be the best guy there. I'm going to blow everybody away, right? So I walk into my first flute lesson in music school. And the guy who was teaching had happened to be at my audition. And he said, well, remember that piece you played in your audition? Take that out. So I brought it out. And I, he says, play. So I played the first measure. He says, stop. And then he picked up his flute and he played it. And he said, make it sound like this. And I couldn't. I could not. I tried three or four times. I could not do what he was doing. And so then he gave me an exercise. He says, play this exercise. It's really simple. <laughs> Just these chromatic long tones. Da, 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 da. But even slower than that. By the end of three of them, I was like... <laughs> So it was like being taken out of the kiddie pool and thrown into the deep end. Huh? I wasn't in Kansas anymore, that's for sure. Or New Jersey or wherever I came from. So <laughs> suddenly I was playing in ensembles, band and orchestra and jazz band and you know, chamber orchestra and stuff like this, with seniors and juniors in, in conservatory. And these guys were like light years ahead of me. Huh? So I was out of my depth and I realized, uh oh, I have a lot to catch up on. So it's the same thing. When somebody is in a uh, small group practice. Uh, it's like a big fish in a small pond. You may think you're hot stuff. You may think you know what you're doing. But then you run into somebody who really knows their stuff. And you're like, so what do you do? Do you rationalize it away and go back to the kiddie pool? Or do you take it like a man and do the work to become really competent? 
See? That's the difference between a cheater and someone with integrity. I got news for you. You're not fooling anybody, except maybe some of the people in the kiddie pool, except maybe yourself. <laughs> You're only going to cheat yourself out of an opportunity to improve. So, as if love, you know, bhakti is love. As if, as if that's different from any other skill? Huh? We're not talking about cheap, sentimental love. We're talking about the kind of love where one would willingly lay down one's life for the beloved. That kind of dedication, that kind of integrity is required for advanced stages of bhakti. We're talking about raganuga bhakti, which is full of ecstatic symptoms. And we're going to go over these when we get to uh, Rasa Tattva series. Unless you're experiencing those ecstatic symptoms, and they're very clear what they are in the scriptures and among the advanced bhaktas, you have no business even thinking about Ananya Bhakti. Huh? Because you're not ready. You're not ready. Go back, do your homework, get good at it, at the basics, and then try again. The background is necessary. Otherwise, you will not understand the instructions. You won't understand the practice. You won't even understand the terminology. If I start talking about, you know, Raganuga Bhakti, it's based on your Ishta Devata and your Bhava. What is your Bhava? Your Stai Bhava. Uh, what is it? Do you even know what those things mean? Then what are you talking about? Ananya Bhakti. You don't even know Raganuga Bhakti. You never even practiced Vaidhi Bhakti. Huh? You know why? Because you're envious. And you're unwilling to surrender to an actual guru. Bhagwan Sri Ramana is the best guru anybody could have. And he's totally available on the energy field. All you have to do is sincerely open up and connect. But you have to be pure. Huh? You have to deserve it. My Ishta, I mean, sorry, my Adi Guru, Prabhupada, used to say, deserve, then desire. So you should develop the qualities first and then aspire to the higher stages. Otherwise, all that's going to happen is you'll jump up and fall down like you've done a million times before. And that's why I'm doing this series to uh, give you the perspective so that you know where you're at so you don't deceive yourself anymore huh i'm not going to cheat you i'm not going to say oh yes you're so advanced you're so intelligent yeah here's the highest technique see it says right here in the scriptures this is the highest oh you can't do it well it must not it must be because you're not surrendered to me yeah you got to surrender more Where's that bank account again? I'm not going to cheat you. I'm going to tell you the real thing. You're not qualified. Don't even talk about Ananya Bhakti. Listen first. Listen deeply for a long time. And practice. So most people misunderstand Bhakti, Ananya Bhakti. They misunderstand Bhagwan. They think that Bhagwan is cerebral or intellectual and that his uh, teaching can be practiced that way too. But what do you make of the fact that Bhagwan reached the highest stage of enlightenment at age 16 without any study, without any sadhana, without any knowledge, without any puja, 
without any following any rules, huh? just spontaneously. What do you think of that? You think that was because he studied and he had a bunch of intellectual knowledge about it? No, not possible. But in a previous life, he must have mastered all these things. And he was just so ripe that the first little hint was enough to send him to the highest realization. So who is qualified like that? Are you? Am I? How about all those teachers who are charging so much money for seminars and retreats and, and building temples and all of this stuff? Are they? No. Bhagwan is unique in thousands of years of human history. So if he's giving instructions, he must know what he's talking about. And we went over this and over it and over it and over it. <laughs> in Upadesha Undiyar. And then again in the esoteric teaching series. That the natural order of yogas is karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, jnana yoga. Now, it really almost doesn't matter what flavor of bhakti, what flavor of karma yoga, or what, you know, style of meditation you use in Raja Yoga. Almost doesn't matter at all. That's up to you. That's a detail. But the thing that is definitely a natural law, an immutable law, a universal principle of all spirituality, is this order of yogas. And there are deep psychological reasons for it that I don't have time to go into now. This is already getting too long. <laughs> but th those yogas should be done in that sequence. And within each yoga, the stages of each yoga must be done in their sequence. Or you're going to fall down. If you try to jump up, you're going to fall down. How many times do I have to say it? You know, I'm not just making this up, although I have experienced it in my life. And, I, you know, two or three times I tried to write my biography, my spiritual biography. And I found that I didn't really understand why certain things happened the way they did. Until <laughs> I read Upadesha Undiyar, then it was so clear. Oh, of course. I tried to do this, I wasn't qualified, so I fell down. And slowly, slowly, I became qualified. And then eventually I did do that. And I really did it, and I mastered it, and then I went on to the next stage, and so on and so on. But for sure, every time I tried to jump up, I just fell down. And you will too. Until you're ready to <laughs> accept it and surrender and actually uh, follow this teaching, this very, very advanced teaching of Ramana Maharshi. So, what can I say? Another way to look at it is to go backwards. Okay, here I am, I'm trying to follow Maharshi, Ramana Maharshi, I'm trying to realize the self, and it's not happening. You know how long it takes to realize the self? Five minutes. So if after five minutes you haven't realized the self, you are doing something wrong. Okay? So what are you doing wrong? Let's see. I just tried to realize the self and it didn't happen. What's wrong? Well, what's the stage before jnana yoga? Raja yoga, right? So, okay, look at your Raja Yoga practice. How are you doing with your mantra? Are you seeing the light? Have you attained the four path realizations given by the Buddha or whatever stages of, of whatever path you're following? If not, why not? 
and it usually has something to do with the previous stage being incomplete. In this case of Raja Yoga, it would be Bhakti Yoga. What haven't you realized about Bhakti? Now, a lot of people cheat. When I was a Buddhist monk, I saw many Buddhists, quote unquote Buddhists, who were trying to make their heart cold and then meditate. And then they wondered why they kept falling down. Because you can't make the heart cold. Well, you can, but you'll kill yourself. You'll kill your love. You'll, you'll kill your inner life, your sweetness. You'll run out of juice. So, see, every center in the body, and this, this was the whole th uh, thesis of Devananda Samadhi Yoga. Every center in the body has to be engaged according to its nature. And it has to be linked. That's the name, I mean, sorry, that's the meaning of yoga, is linking. So it has to be linked with the self, directly or indirectly, either directly to the self or through some other centers which are directly linked. Then the ecstasy will flow. Then the samadhi will happen naturally then the realization will occur. So if some, if meditation is not working, okay, that's this center, then what about the next center down? What about your mantra? And if that's not working, what about the heart center? If you're not in love, if you're not in love ecstasy in your heart center, how can you meditate? How can you do your mantra nicely? Not by force. That's not love. Love is spontaneous attraction to something sublime and beautiful. So if you're forcing things, that's not love. If you're forcing your meditation, forcing your mantra, forcing yourself to sit down and meditate, huh? that's wrong. It's not going to work. You're going to fall down. Why? Because you jumped up. <laughs> you weren't complete in bhakti or metta or whatever you want to call it. And if, you're, if you can't get your bhakti even started, well, is there something wrong in your karma yoga? Huh? Maybe you have some uh, problems in your life that you haven't solved. Maybe you have some uh, things that you need to know or things that you need to take care of that you're not addressing. You have to look into it. You have to solve these problems for yourself. Nobody's going to do it for you. And if anybody is qualified to do it for you, they're going to charge you pretty hefty consulting fees. And of course, then they're going to try to hook you. And, uh, look, go back to the beginning, watch all these video series from the start, apply them all in your life. You know, it goes all the way back to matrix learning and misunderstood terms. If you have been clearing your misunderstood terms all along, looking for the definitions and finding them, and using them in examples, sentences, until you understand them perfectly, you would know and be able to apply everything I'm saying here. But if you're going, oh, well, man, that's too advanced, I don't understand it. Or like that poor guy in the conversation with uh, Ramana, I don't understand. Man, it's your mind. It's your life. Do you want it to be beautiful? Or do you want to continue muddling along and screwing up and suffering? You know, it's up to you. We're giving you the tools, but you have to use them. I can't do it for you even if I wanted to, which I don't. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om. Karunar Navamai Kardakkadinalgum Arunachala Shivam 
ಸಂಗೀತ